Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive with Dr. Rebecca Risk. Do you ever feel that even though nothing seems seriously wrong and you pass all the medical tests, that you still feel that your health, pain, and fatigue are completely out of control? It doesn't have to be that way. Listen to the tips and suggestions given on our program today and take back control of your health. Now, here is Dr. Rebecca Risk. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Falling Through the Cracks. Today, we're talking with Kathleen Dean Moore, who is an environmental philosopher, climate activist, and writer, the author and co-author of dozen, a dozen books that celebrate and defend the beautiful reeling world. Today, we're discussing her novel, Piano Tide. Kathleen, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Rebecca. It's good to be here. Yeah, we did have a conversation, I think, about a year and a half ago about uh, climate change. And, and now you've got this novel out, which is um, tying everything together, which I love to read, by the way. Thank you so much for putting this together. Well, sure. You know, I thought if I'm going to be a climate activist, I have to have some very, very clear idea about how the resistance to the um extraction industry will unfold. And I thought, well, I can't just think about that in the abstract. I have to imagine it in every particular. And so I thought, well, that's going to have to be a novel. And that's the origin of Piano Time. So first, can you just tell us how you got involved in climate change? Oh, it happened in one day. I was visiting my um, granddaughter, my little granddaughter up in Vancouver, and uh, I read that day a statement by 500 scientists led by a team from Stanford. They said, unless all nations take immediate action, by the time today's children are middle-aged, the life support systems of the world will be irretrievably damaged. And I was sitting there, as my, as my granddaughter was going to sleep, I was sitting beside her in this dim light, and she hummed herself to sleep when she was little. She was humming, uh, laugh, kookaburra, laugh, kookaburra. And I was sitting there thinking, by the time she's middle-aged, Zoe, my Zoe, and I thought, you know, that's it. I can't do anything in my working life but try to make the world a safe place for this little girl and and the young people of all different species. So it was a very abrupt transformation. Well, you know, I think it's a really important one. Um, You know, I I hear on a a monthly or even sometimes weekly basis, somebody says to me that that climate change isn't really happening and and that humans aren't affecting anything. And, you know, I I have conversations like what you and I are having right now all the time on my show um, or just in life. I'm very passionate about this. And I am so surprised that somebody doesn't doesn't want to take responsibility for for what we're doing we're we're using too many resources and we're we're responsible for the earth and and we're damaging it and i think you know that would be the same as being just a caregiver for your granddaughter daughter and hurting her in another way um you know right. that that's not the right thing to do and uh um do you have any comments about that Well, I do. You know, there's the primary denial where you're saying, oh, climate change isn't really happening, or if it is, it's not caused by human beings. That's just a kind of self-serving lie, I think, for people who want to continue doing what they're doing. But I think the more serious problem is this secondary denial. It's just huge numbers of people who say, yes, it's happening. It's upon us. It's, It's harmful. It's going to hurt the people I love the best. And then don't make any changes in their life. Don't transform into great defenders of their their planet and their children. This is, I think, a more serious problem. Well, I, you know, I definitely agree. And and now your novel, um, you it seemed to me that you took um, some story, an idea, time a storyline that happens a lot um, in in fishing villages. I would guess I'm from the prairie, so I have very little knowledge of of fishing and and you know what happens in that realm and how that is being affected. But um, you have the title Piano Tide. And your main character yeah. has a piano, but does piano tide have another meaning? Well, literally, a piano tide is what I call these great high tides. If you want to move a piano from the bow of your boat onto land, you're going to need a big tide. Uh, you don't want to be dragging that piano across the intertidal slippery rocks. 
you want to tuck your boat right up under the lip of the land and be able to throw down a plank and, and pull it off. Um, and so these big tides that happen once a month, I call piano tides for that reason. And the point is that those are dangerous tides. They are potential tides. There are uh, times when the, the water will lift things that had been hidden or stored away, the great logs along the edge of the shore. And so you have to be careful on a high tide when you're running your boat. And it seems to me that we are in a situation, too, where we're having a high tide, uh, a great surge of moral affirmation of the value of the earth, a great coming together around action to save the planet. And um, it also is a time of, of danger and opportunity, a time when things can can move and also a time when there are traps. So, yeah, Piano Tide is quite intentionally designed to make people think about uh, a time of great change. Which is definitely what's happening. I feel like we're at this this peak where if we don't make changes, everything's going to crash down around us and it, or burn around us, which it seems like is happening every summer, um, you know, and, and we're having more catastrophes than we used to. And, um, you know, do you have comments about that? Well, you're right. There is this great tide of of damage and destruction. I mean, literally against the shores with the rising seas. Again, with the fires, as you say, so many ways that the the tide of damage is rising. But also at the same time, there's this great rising tide of outrage against the pillage of the planet. This new tide of commitment to justice and. And there's this affirmation that's just rising like a great tide uh, of our responsibility to care for the earth. So we have the clashing of two great tides. It's an important time. It, it it definitely is, and you know, um, a, a month ago, I I interviewed Vince Beiser about his book, uh, The World in a Grain, and um, we we talked about sand and beaches and and sand mining, and and you know, you're you're talking about the tide and the ocean and and fishing in, in your book, yeah, and it, they definitely I didn't realize when I booked these shows, but they seem to to tie in together. Um, you know, damage that's being done in in those parts of the world and the ecosystems and, and everything that, that's being affected. Right. Everywhere everywhere you look is the same kind of issue. I mean, the question is arising in so many places, particularly in terms of extractive industry, is it wrong to wreck the world? Is it wrong to consider the world just a uh, pile of rocks and trees that you can use and plunder and pillage as you want to, um, or is it something much more important? Is it a nourishing, a spiritually nourishing and a physically nourishing uh, place that uh, we have a responsibility to, to care for? And that kind of, those two views of the world are coming into conflict everywhere you look. Um, at Standing Rock, in the great fracking fields, up in the tar sands, every place where people are standing against this ruinous extraction, you have this conflict between two different worlds, of, two different views of, of what the world is and what it asks of us. Well, yeah, for sure, because there are people who who have no problem with, you know, fracking and digging up sand or, or um, you know, overfishing or all, all the things that we're doing, logging, um, and, and to an extent. I mean, even in, in that conversation about sand, we talk about how a, a lot of it was illegal. So even when laws are put into place, there is still, there are still people who, who are, are no, they don't care. They're, you know, their their main focus is about the money that they're going to make with what they're doing and not the consequences and the damage that's being done. You have that problem where, where the extractive industries are violating the law. And then you have a, a perhaps even more insidious problem, at least in the United States, where there's a collusion between the governments and the extractive industries. In fracking, for example, where the extractive industries have captured the regulatory agencies at all levels of government. And so you find that the laws are being rewritten to favor the extractive industries. Um, I think about the Halliburton loophole in the United States that allows fracking fluids to be exempt from the Clean Water Act, laws that are written and pushed by extractive industry. So, so in, un, in many ways, there's violations of the law, but in other ways, there are, you know, violations of the spirit of a democratic law. 
Well, definitely. And, and you know, we I think we always think, especially in this part of the world, that, that the laws are there to protect us. And we often, you know, when we think about somebody violating laws or or doing something, we think of countries where, where the police are being bought off. You know, um, yeah. Vince and I spoke about India where, you know, th- there was laws, but everybody was just paid off. And, and we don't think in this part of the world that the the laws are unjust we think that they're going to protect us that they are there and and that if and everybody's being compliant and everything's okay yeah i've been working on another book about fracking and human rights and we just um just heard from an international human rights court that uh, made the ruling that fracking is a widespread the processes of that are a widespread violation of human rights the right to health, the right to participate, the right to life, and that not only that, but that fracking can't take place without it. It is inherently violative of human rights. And so this international court judged that it should be banned worldwide. Yeah, which I think a lot of people would agree with, because not only do we have the the effects of fracking, where the you know um, there are some some earthquakes and damage, but there's just even the dust in the air and and the the health of the people near where they're fracking, um, you know, and the the overall over um, over consumption of everything that we are digging up and making things that we don't need, and and not looking at how we're using things as well. Yes, both those. In, in the United States, in, Pen- in Pennsylvania, a newly uncovered crisis where they're seeing uh, large increases in the numbers of rare childhood cancers near the fracking fields. Uh, these uh, efforts to, to shroud the health effects in secrecy are falling apart in many ways, and people are starting to understand the effects. Well, and it it takes a long time for for us to recognize that as well. I think we, you know, have gotten excited about finding products and digging them up and using them, and and how easy our lives have have gotten. You know, um, just with the sand, the conversation on sand again, we we use sand even in technology. So you and I wouldn't be able to have this conversation without mm-hmm. the, the use of sand, which which makes it very difficult because we're used to this life that we have and um, you know not everybody can walk away from it not it, it w- and it won't happen that fast so but there needs there definitely needs to be change we are living very comfortable lives but do you sense that there is a, a deep uh, moral uneasiness about it and that people recognize first of all that it can't continue that it's doing damage to people who do not deserve to be harmed causing suffering to innocent people, children, the plants and animals, future generations. People are starting to understand this and are looking, I think, for ways that they can uh, lead lives that don't make them complicit. Well, and there, I read an article um, just a few months ago about the the rise in depression and anxiety. Um, it's higher than it's ever been, and uh, we have. Uh, I, I think this is down to pollution and our food, which is actually down to <laughs> the, the same kind mm-hmm. of thought process we're we're discussing today. Um, and, and you know. Th- that that is telling that that we are going in the wrong direction. Whatever the cause is of the depression, there's something missing. And um, if we're not happy as a society, we need to look at what we need to do to change it. Yes, I would agree, and and I think there's a moral disease too. Uh, people want to be people of integrity. They want to have a matching between what they believe is right and what they do. And uh, when there when there is a discordance between those, I, I think people are, are deeply unsettled. Yeah, I agree. Uh, we're going to take a, a break. We're talking today with Kathleen Dean Moore, and we're discussing her novel Piano Tide. We'll be back shortly. Become our friend on Facebook. Post your thoughts about our shows and network on our timeline. Visit Facebook.com forward slash Voice America. Are you finding your frequency? It can be described as that space between failure and success. It's the future of digital media. It's finding your voice. 
It's engaging topics, content, and ideas. Jeff and Ryan discuss the digital media space and all of its aspects. It's about making the mistakes, taking the chances, summoning the intestinal fortitude to step out of your comfort zone, and discovering what you can accomplish when you decide to try, decide to learn, decide that you have something to say, and find your frequency. Live Fridays at 12 noon Pacific Time, 3 p.m. Eastern Time on the Voice America Variety Channel. Is your health where you think it should be? If you're like most people, the answer is probably not. Where can you get the answers you need to get on the right track? The answers start on Occupy Health. Each week, host Dr. Susan Downs and her guest experts will answer your questions as well as prepare you for questions you'll want to ask your health provider. You'll want to plan for your optimal health with Occupy Health. Listen Fridays at 11 a.m. Pacific Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Time on Voice America Health & Wellness. Can grief be good for you? Absolutely. It gets your attention, helping you evaluate your choices and relationships. Your losses define who you are. Tune in each week for Good Grief with host Cheryl Jones. Our show features those who have made incredible transformations by grieving their losses. You'll learn how to find your courage and strength. You'll discover the important things in your life and how to let go of things that are less important. Good Grief airs live Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Pacific Time, 5 p.m. Eastern on Voice America Health and Wellness. Have you friended us on Facebook yet? Why not? Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for the keywords Voice America. Once you are part of our Facebook network, you'll receive daily messages about what's happening with our shows, this week's featured guests, and new happenings at the Voice America Talk Radio Network. And you can add your voice to the always active discussions on our timeline. Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for Voice America. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. A stain-free and clean home is something to be proud about, but it's hard to maintain when you're using cleaning products that don't work well or take forever to use. Q Carbona, a household brand that has turned their decades of cleaning expertise into products that get the job done fully, quickly, and easily. When I heard about Stain Devils, my stain removing game was changed. Think about this. If you have a chocolate stain, it wouldn't make sense to treat it with a formula that removes wine because they're chemically different. Knowing this, Carbona created specific stain removers for specific stain types. Genius, right? Both stain removers have highly efficient products for your laundry, carpet, washing, and washing machine. Now, don't forget that my co-host Oliver, who's a Chihuahua cross, sits with me through all my shows. And he wants to remind you that there is the pet stain and odor remover, which he is absolutely in love with. Want to start living your life unstained? Shop Carbona.com with code FTTC for 20% off your order. So, Kathleen, I know you you have an essay for us um, that is called Why We Won't Quit the Climate Fight. Do you mind sharing that with us? I would be pleased to do that. This is a piece that I wrote with my colleague Sue Ellen Campbell. Here's what it says. We are old climate veterans who have tried to do our part in every way we know how to keep our fossil fuel addicted civilization from driving off a cliff. Are we tired? Sure. Discouraged? Absolutely. Angry? Yep. Sad? Call it broken hearted. Are we quitting? It might be time. Game over, friends and experts tell us. We're doomed. It's true that the news about global warming is awful. The IPC now gives the world 12 years to cut global greenhouse gas emissions in half if we are to stop warming at only 1.5 degrees Celsius. Don't think quitting hasn't crossed our minds. Last month, on the way from one meeting to another, we stopped along the coast to watch a red sun set through purple clouds. While parents gathered up their families, children lingered ankle-deep in pink water, looking out to sea. A flock of gulls flew north. 
Why do we keep doing this climate work, we asked each other. Maybe to our surprise, answers to the question flooded out, one reason after another. Because we are not doomed as long as we act, a world in which we do everything we can to restrain climate change barely resembles one in which we do nothing. We won't like the first world, but we might not survive in the second. Because one of the kind of person who doesn't give up on important jobs, you don't do what's right because you think it might get you something. You do it because it's right. That's what integrity is, doing what you believe in even if it won't save the world. Because I won't walk away from the hurting world any more than I will walk away from my mother as she grows old and frail and sometimes confused. I love her and owe her and have a duty to her and admire her and enjoy her company. Because I promised my newborn children, I will always love you. I will keep you safe. I will give you the world. I didn't mean I will give you whatever is left, scattered and torn on the table after the great cosmic going out of business sale. I said, I will give you this beautiful, life-sustaining, bird-graced world. Because climate change is unjust. It threatens the greatest violation of human rights the world has ever seen. But injustice is cowardly and fragile. It crumbles when people stand up for what's right. Because we don't want to be free riders taking advantage of the actions, often sacrifices of those who step up. If we avoid planetary ruin, if we find a better way to live, it will be because of the courage of those who act. Because I'm wearing my dad's rubber boots, they're too big for me, but my own are old and torn. So I'm walking in the boots he wore at the edge of all the marshes he defended until the day he died. If you're walking in the shoes of a hero, you can't exactly turn back. Because despair is lonely and useless, while climate action is full of friendship, satisfaction, and glee, you get to hang out with people who care as much as you do and act with the same remorseless resolve. Taking action is the only real cure for hopelessness. It feels good and important like you're not wasting your life on small things. We sat on a beach log, mulling over our reasons to stay in the struggle until the stars came out and a breeze came up. Then we walked back to the car on a mossy trail through a tunnel of spruce trees. A Swainson's thrush sang and would not stop singing, even in the deepest dusk. And that also was a reason. The deep moss was a reason. So were the ancient trees. So were the children standing in the swash. Um, Thank you for for sharing that. Um, You know, I I think it's important for us to to have these conversations that that we are having now. Um, Now, in your... In your novel, you focus on um, fishing and, and, and logging. What is happening in those industries that's doing damage? The uh, little town where I set my uh, novel called Good River Harbor is a tidal community imaginary in Alaska. And it has been, for many, many years, living off the land, which is to say it's been making a killing by mining out the dark hemlock trees, the um, salmon, the halibut, by cutting the yellow cedar. And now the uh, companies are deciding that they're having mined all all those resources, so-called resources. They're going to sell the water from a salmon stream. And that is when the townspeople say, you know, is it possible to to make a, a living without wrecking the place? Is it possible for us to stand up and resist this kind of exploitation that's going to empty this place out? And so when I started to think about how my characters might respond, I found that they were brave and they were funny and they were good and they were hapless and they got up every morning and put on their car hearts and, and in their own stumbling way found a way to stop that kind of exploitation and allow the salmon to return home. And isn't that what it's so often about is returning home. Um, This is the motivation for the people who are trying to stay in that place. And uh, I think this is the motivation of all of us is to find a way to live in a place that nourishes it rather than wrecks it. 
Well, you know, I, I definitely, I agree with that. My, my mother, when she retired, uh, that was her goal <laughs> her whole time. And unfortunately you have to save up and, and retire to, she felt to, to do what she wanted, but she now lives off the land. Um, I've had her on the show before to, to talk about it because it, it's important for both of us. And um, she wanted to reduce her carbon footprint and she found she couldn't do that in the city. So she now lives out in the country. And she found it very difficult when she was working to to do that because of the way, you know, society is set up that she had need for certain things while she was working. Um, but, you know, I, I you're right. It is important for And she does feel actually like she returned home. So she's the great analogy for for that the example for that analogy. Um, but, you know, I definitely agree with you. So, um, in in fishing villages, um, what what exactly happens? How is that set up? When, when are there big commercial fish fisheries, or are there small smaller smaller boats the way there used to be? I I am no expert on the fishery in Alaska. the The novel is an imagining of an unregulated fishery. However, in Alaska now, the regulations are very strict in some places and not at all in others. It seems that people are, are um, being allowed to fish out the um, herring in the little inlets all around Alaska. But in the great salmon fishery in Bristol Bay, that seems to be a very sustainable fishery there. And uh, if people have a chance, they should support it. Get a little word in here. Um, mm-hmm. by, uh, by buying uh, sustainably caught salmon from from Alaska. Well, and, and I, I think that's important, too, because we are still going to consume things. But one thing that we're not always aware of is is consuming, you know, choosing to consume things that are causing less damage, you know, so um, choosing things that aren't as disposable or choosing fish that come from from a fishery that are are replenishing the environment and giving back as well as as fishing or same with with logging. That's our challenge, isn't it? To find ways to to use a, the sustaining gifts that the environment offers at the same time as we increase their resilience and increase their ability to help themselves. So in some ways what our work in the world is is to, is to find ways to let the earth help us rather than destroying the capacity of the earth to help us. Um, and we can do that by being careful about what we eat, being careful about the uh, way we fish, being careful about the way we farm, where we're building up rather than just reaming it out. So so in your novel, do you find, uh, did you choose to have different characters represent different theories about environmental ethics? Well, you know, I'm an environmental ethics philosopher teacher. And I wanted a book that I could use in my classes that would make, that would raise all these kind of hard, you know, environmental ethics questions about how to live in the land. And also, um, I wanted one that would talk to my students about what our obligations are. In this book, we have a spectacular and quite illegal and quite destructive act of resistance. Um, and I won't say more than that, but um, I wanted I wanted readers to be able to say, you know, where what should I be doing here? What are the limits of my of my responsibilities, and or are there limits to them? Um, so, so I didn't assign um, different philosophical views to different people, but they certainly do come into conflict based on their worldviews, um, and that was really one of the really fun things is to say, okay, here's here's a character. Um, what does she believe, and how does that manifest in what she does? So here's um, here's Nora, who comes to this town with her piano because she has burned her bridges in the lower 48, and she's trying to fade into the bushes there and use her piano as an anchor that will hold her there. How much is she willing to give up this possibility of finding a home finally in order to protect that home? How much are people willing to give up uh, of what they've worked hard to, to um, achieve in order to um, to save what they loved too much to lose? Well, it, so it, was know, fun it, watch, it was fun watching the um, sorry, it was fun watching the characters wrestle with those problems, argue about them, 
drink too much beer while they talked about them. <laughs> well, it just seems like this might be how your classes go as well, um, even if somebody's just playing devil's advocate to have these conversations about um you know, the different ethics of, of what are going on, because people do have different opinions and different ideas of, of what should change and how. Yes, and I would just point out that our, our, our philosophy, I mean, our college students are magnificent. They are very well educated about climate change. They know very much about what's happening, and they also feel that uh, they are threatened, their futures are threatened, they know these things. Um, and so they are looking for alternative ways of making a living, alternative ways of living, and they're being very creative and, I would say, beautiful about it. The time for us to be saying, uh, bemoaning the state of our students is past. They are magnificent. Do you find, um, as a teacher, that, that that's happening more and more with younger generations, that they are more aware than, say, um, my generation or your generation were? I think that they're saying to their universities, okay, we have work to do in this world. We're going to need a set of skills, and uh, we want you to provide that set of skills to us. So they're being very intentional about getting the abilities that they need to make good decisions about how to live, creative decisions about how to live. Um, I need to know how to write. I need to know how to think. I need to know how to to judge evidence. Um, they're... they're um, not just sitting back and letting us feed them whatever we think is important. They are taking charge. Um, which is really important. I, I think people need to take charge. So I'm glad that you are helping them gain the skills and, you know, putting this novel together so other people can can have those conversations just amongst themselves so they don't necessarily have to take a class and to be aware of, of the ideas and the situations that are happening. Yeah, and that was the challenge, was to make this a page-turner, to make this, you know, ferociously funny. The, the challenge was to create characters that people couldn't um, escape. Uh, and that was the fun of, of, of writing this book, was to, was to write a book that people would pick up at the airport and want to read. Mm -hmm, which I definitely think that you did. Um, we're going to take a quick break. We're talking today with Kathleen Dean Moore, and we're discussing her book, uh, her novel, Piano Tide. We'll be back shortly. Become our friend on Facebook. Post your thoughts about our shows and network on our timeline. Visit Facebook.com forward slash Voice America. Are you finding your frequency? It can be described as that space between failure and success. It's the future of digital media. It's finding your voice. It's engaging topics, content, and ideas. Jeff and Ryan discuss the digital media space and all of its aspects. It's about making the mistakes, taking the chances, summoning the intestinal fortitude to step out of your comfort zone, and discovering what you can accomplish when you decide to try, decide to learn, decide that you have something to say, and find your frequency. Live Fridays at 12 noon Pacific Time, 3 p.m. Eastern Time, on the Voice America Variety Channel. your health where you think it should be if you're like most people the answer is probably not where can you get the answers you need to get on the right track the answers start on occupy health each week host dr susan downs and her guest experts will answer your questions as well as prepare you for questions you'll want to ask your health provider you'll want to plan for your optimal health with occupy health listen fridays at 11 a.m pacific time 2 p.m eastern time on voice america health and wellness can grief be good for you? Absolutely. It gets your attention, helping you evaluate your choices and relationships. Your losses define who you are. Tune in each week for Good Grief with host Cheryl Jones. Our show features those who have made incredible transformations by grieving their losses. You'll learn how to find your courage and strength. You'll discover the important things in your life and how to let go of things that are less important. Good Grief airs live Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Pacific Time, 5 p.m. Eastern on Voice America Health and Wellness. 
Have you friended us on Facebook yet? Why not? Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for the keywords Voice America. Once you are part of our Facebook network, you'll receive daily messages about what's happening with our shows, this week's featured guests, and new happenings at the Voice America Talk Radio Network. And you can add your voice to the always active discussions on our timeline. Just go to Facebook.com forward slash Voice America or search for Voice America. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Riss. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Riss. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Today, we're talking with Kathleen Dean Moore, and we're discussing her novel, Piano Tide. Now, Kathleen, I know you have a segment to share with us from the book. Yeah, this comes towards the end. Um, Here we have um, Axel Hagerman uh, putting up a dam that will make a reservoir from which he can ship water to Japan to be bottled and to be sold in 7-Elevens down in Los Angeles. And here we have his wife up at the top of the mountain trying to figure out how she's going to take out that dam. So with the free edge of the bandana, Rebecca swiped at tears as she climbed across the meadow. So here is the greatest mystery. What kind of person would dam salmon from a river? What kind of person would cut the salmon off when they're moving most urgently, stop them just short of home after they have traveled a thousand miles to get there? Who could do that? Who could deny them? Hundreds of fish struggling upstream. How could that ever be right in what morally corrosive world? Dam a river and salmon will throw their bodies against the dam until their faces are white with torn flesh. Then they will thin slowly in the cold tailwater, stinking and dying like old men outside the door at the Greyhound station. When Tick turned off the chainsaw, the silence was a holiness she almost remembered, water flowing onto rock in the stillness of the mountain. The words she wanted to say to Axel tumbled through her mind. We'll come back here when it's over, Axel. You'll sit beside me and never once think about how you could market the meadow. You'll think about how beautiful it is and how strong I am and how blessed you are to be in this place. We'll tell the story of the flood we sent into the valley to save your soul. We will make love then. It will be awkward, our rubber raincoats squeaking and sticking together. We will laugh and tug at the endless layers. Is there no end to this tugging and pulling, you will moan? Is there any way to get off a boot but to hop and yank? But then our clothes will be in a pile in the blueberry bushes, and we will stand naked in our woolen socks. You will stroke my hair away from my cheeks and hold my face in your hands, using your thumbs to wipe the dew from my eyelashes. And you will say, maybe you mumble this into my hair, you will say, we can find a better way, Rebecca. There has to be a better way. Well, well, thank you for for sharing that there has to be a better way you're right um that's, now that's that's what the book is about is we've, we've 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 got ourselves into ways that are not good enough there has to be a better way to live mm-hmm. so so saying that is there anything that you think people can do to make some of these changes yeah i think so um, let me point out that the question I often get after I've spoken to a group is, what can one person do? And my answer to that question is always, stop being one person. That's a lonely thing. Start working with other people. Join up with your neighbors. Join up with your friends. Join up with organizations. And you'll be a far more effective force. So that's the general advice I have. But then when I heard that the um, International Plan- Panel, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has given us 12 years to cut our climate emissions in half in order to avoid irreversible ruinous damage, I set out and I wrote a climate defender's calendar, which is a 12-year plan, everything we have to do one year after another. It was kind of chic, but I, thought, um, I gave a lot of thought that we would do in the first year, which is the year we are in right now. And generally, before people go into battle, uh, they have some sort of acts of self-care, right? 
they uh, gird their loins. They they get themselves ready for the struggle, for the struggle, which primarily is making sure that we're fighting on the right side in this in this contest. So I say, in the long tradition of battle, we will begin with self purification. Basically, you just have to make sure you're not fighting for the wrong side, a foot soldier in the war against the world. And isn't this what we are when we uh, just go along with business as usual? So I say this is the year to dump all your investments in fossil fuels. Stop eating meat. Save a chunk of Arctic ice the size of a school bus by canceling your international eco-tour. Tithe to environmental justice organizations that don't take oil money and make sure that all your electricity comes from renewable sources. So that's the list for this year, and I think it's a pretty straightforward list that doesn't take all that much to achieve. But um, once we are no longer profiting, we've, we've, we've done no longer profiting from fossil fuel um, riches, and once we've, we've done what we think is right, um, then we will be able to take the next steps. So, so what do you think? Is that a reasonable list? That that these are not things that are hard to achieve, but they're things that put us on the right side of the struggle. Well, for sure, and I, I like that you said, to, you know, don't do it alone. Um, this is where a lot of people struggle when they have to make changes, is they get overwhelmed and they don't ask for help. And, um, you know, it, it, it having a group or joining a group that is involved um, can, of course, make you feel less alone. And um, getting help to make some of those changes, if they seem overwhelming, can also also be a, a really good idea. Yeah, yeah. And then um, it's important, too, to act politically. It's important to make changes in our private lives so that we have the moral authority to go out into the world and try to make changes in the political life. And that's where the real big changes are going to happen, maybe in municipalities, small towns, maybe in cities or provinces, or maybe at the federal level. But in the United States, um, we have an election coming very, very soon. And so next year is going to be the year of the election. Uh, the point that I would make is that we're not fighting climate change. We're fighting those men, and they are men, who are blocking the world from making the changes that will restrain climate change. We know what we need to do, but we are being blocked at every, at every step by those who are filling their pockets with this cold, hard cash. So our calling this next year, and I'm not sure about what the Canadian election cycle is. I'm sorry about that. But our, our challenge in the United States now is to identify these politicians who are soaked in oil, whose pockets are stuffed with this dirty money, and, and hold their feet to the fire. Um, that seems to me to be, in the United States at least, our one and only duty next year. And I also think everything depends on it. And that is not an exaggeration. Well, and, and I, I agree, and I, I'm going to come back to the word ethical, because that's really what's important when we make these decisions, is not to make decision about what will bring money, but make a decision about what is ethical for our environment, for our future, and for our children's future, so that these decisions also will be sustainable. So if we have a struggling um, oil and gas industry, which I'm sorry, Calgary, um, but, you know, that we can make a decision that perhaps the industry needs to change um, and and that, that it, you know, it, it's struggling anyway. So maybe some change into something that isn't causing as much damage might be more helpful. And as we do that, I think um, the changes that we may do, as you say, need to be towards sustainability. They also need to be humane and consultative so that as we look for solutions, we look for solutions together across all of our differences. And we remember that as we implement changes, there will be people who will be hurt and that we need to find ways to humane transition to clean energy that fully honor the uh, need for people to have livable wage in work that they believe in. And if we don't, then we'll just make enemies and we'll divide ourselves. But um, if we think hu with humility and with humanity in our minds, then I think we can have quite a different set of decisions. 
Well, and I agree. And and we're going to run out of the resources that we're using. So we need to start using resources that that aren't going to run out. So if we go back to the conversation I had about sand, we we are going to run out of sand. We we are running out of it, and um, we are v- rely on it quite a bit. And so if we can start making decisions that that replace sand in those places we will need less of it and if we make the decision when we do that to use something that won't run out or that is reusing then we're we're going to cause less damage we won't have the crisis that we're having or we won't ever get to a crisis um, because we're almost there and if we don't if we don't do something about it we're just going to crash well, in the analogy between sand and fossil fuels, I think it's very apt. We will run out of them. I think we'll run out of the carbon absorbing capacity of the of the atmosphere long before we run out of fuel. But we there is a limit to how much fossil fuel. Well, we've reached it. We can we can use, and uh, there it may be in contrast to sand, but there with fossil fuels, there's a very obvious source of energy that is renewable that we could turn to very quickly if we had the political will. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I definitely agree on that one. Now, it, in in your life to make changes, what what have you done? <laughs> that's, that's a good question because I have been, you know, frantic in trying to do all sorts of thousands of different things. Um, I have sold my truck and I drive a Prius. You know, I could go on with this list, but um, you know, I have given up meat. I think of, of beef. I think that's a huge thing. Um, the statistics on beef are, are just crazy that in this, if you just 5% left are wild animals and 36% are human beings and 60% are cows or other kinds of wildlife. That's amazing use of resources on the land. So that small change, I think, is a big change. But, um, and, and on and on, I uh, do not fly overseas anymore. You just can't, and I have um, given up as of the end of this year traveling to speak to. You just can't get on a plane and go talk to people about climate change. So all these things that that, um, you can't in good conscience do, that's that's what I'm trying to give up, but um, I understand the kind of a struggle that that is. And so mostly now my work is to try to encourage those who who are doing this work of, of defending defending um, the planet. I am speaking, writing now about hope. My new book is called Heartening, Encouragement for Earth's Weary Lovers. Um, and so in, any way, in many ways, what I'm trying to do is be the support person behind the scenes who, who comes up with the reasons. All I want to do is, is preach to the choir. I want to give the choir the words to the song. I want to, I want to sing to them to give them courage. I want to um, help them face their own, um, their own, the, the harsh word is hypocrisy, but let me say instead their own struggles to do what they think is right. And um, empower the choir to sing this beautiful Save the Earth symphony. Save the Earth Symphony. I I love that. That's a uh, really that's Sandra good. Steingraber, yeah. isn't she wonderful? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Definitely, definitely agree. Um, so, um, in your classes, I'm I'm actually quite curious about um, what a discussion would look like in an, an environmental ethic class. Okay. Well, first of all, I should make clear that a couple years ago, I left the university in order to work full-time on climate. I felt that the university was in many ways wasting time, and there was no time to waste. So I am freelancing now in the kind of work that I do and the kind of teaching that I do. So um, most recently, the teaching I do is of people who want to write of about the um the climate and the and the moral challenges of it, I am trying to call writers to witness and bringing them into workshops to try to um, give them the skills and the motivation, honestly, to turn away from ordinary sorts of self-serving writing and try to turn towards towards the kind of writing that lets people know what is happening, that calls attention to the glories of the world, right, and, and to the sins against it. Um, 
And I'm trying mm. to talk to writers of many different kinds, not just essayists, but uh, this is what novelists should be doing. This is what um, the uh, science fiction people should be doing. This is what uh, journalists is engaging, the most important issue of well, in cosmic history, as far as I can judge. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I definitely agree. These are some of my um, my favorite conversations because I'm so passionate about it. And, um, you know, I've, I've been asked why I do shows on climate. And um, I feel like our health is at risk because of what we're doing to our environment. And I see that as the biggest factor in almost everybody's health that I see. And it can be different parts that we are affecting. Um, whether it's the damage to the food or environment or the chemicals or environment, um, th- this is one of the biggest biggest things that I see. So I'm I'm glad that there are people like you out there, you know, fighting the the climate change fight and bringing this awareness. I live in Oregon. I'm down here in Oregon, and people and it's very dry here already. And people here are frightened because they remember last summer when. It was when our air was filled with smoke for an entire month, and there was nowhere you could go. You couldn't go to the coast. You couldn't go to the mountains. You couldn't stay in the valleys. The smoke was so thick and coming from so many different directions. And people, as you say, people got sick. And already they're starting to anticipate a fire season, at least as ferocious. Um, and and it's it's really something that has to be addressed right right now. Yeah, I, I agree. It seems like forest fires are just becoming part of summer. Um, so we, we do need to make those changes. Now, if somebody wants to read your novel or get a hold of you for any other information, how can they do so? Well, they can find Piano Tide at any bookstore or online or in their favorite neighborhood independent bookseller. Um, if it's not in there, they could certainly order it. My website is www.riverwalking.com, one word, riverwalking. And I have another website for the work that I'm doing with music, which is called www.musicandclimateaction.com. Well, perfect. I want to thank you so much for joining me again. This was a, a great conversation. Well, thank you, Rebecca, and thank you for the work that you do. I think it's extraordinarily important. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Today we were talking with Kathleen Dean Moore, and her novel was called Piano Tide. And if you want more information about my story or what I went through to my journey back to health, you can find that on my website at dr riskcom uh, Don't forget to follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. And uh, thanks so much for listening. Be sure to make today a great day. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Please join Dr. Rebecca Risk again next Monday at noon Eastern Time and 9 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. We'll talk more next week.